I'm Chris Hansen, right now on Crime Watch Daily from here in New York. A millionaire's wife found dead in the basement of her mansion. There's a woman hanging from the shower. An electrical cord around her neck. It looks like a suicide, but is it murder? It looked like it was staged. A trove of secrets exposed. He had been stalking her. A grainy video that leads cops to a suspect. I see a figure run out of the house. An arrest that shocks everyone. I said, hi, can you stand up? And he stood up, I said, you're under arrest. Plus, an armed intruder storms a house in the middle of the night and opens fire. Me and my mom are die. The gun went off in my chest. I said, oh my God, I'm gonna die on this floor. The desperate hunt for the gunman that ends on Facebook Live. She deserved what she had coming. Right now. Andrea Isom, sir, with Crime Watch yeah. Daily. Jason Mattel with Crime Watch Daily. This. I'm Elizabeth. I'm here with Crime Watch. I'm Michelle from Crime Watch Daily. Anna Garcia from Crime Watch. Is Crime Watch oh, Daily. Stay off my property. We'll find you again. We always do. Welcome to Crime Watch Daily, everyone. I'm Chris Hansen. First up today, a CEO with millions in the bank walks in to find his wife dead. It appears to be a suicide, but as our Michelle Sagona reports, things aren't always what they seem. Chris, it was a normal March night. Castillo had just taken four of his kids out to dinner, and a family member had met up with his estranged wife to drop them off. But what happened next in their multi-million dollar home would shatter their family forever. A mother of five goes missing. They said, mom isn't here, we don't know. And they were crying, they were upset, and they were scared only to be found dead in her mansion basement. There's a woman hanging from the uh, shower. But investigators believe there's more to this apparent suicide than meets the eye. It looked like it was staged. What they don't know is that they're about to enter a twisted world of money. He had a lot of money. Power. He had been stalking her. And dark sex. He would put his hands down her pants behind her back. Don't let this picture-perfect colonial in Virginia fool you. According to their oldest son, Nick, behind closed doors, Abralio and Michelle Castillo were struggling to save their marriage. They were good times, but they were also bad, strained a lot of the time. It wasn't always that way. Both wanted a big family. They adopted their first two children, then had three of their own. Together, they ran a highly successful IT business, and thanks to Braulio's status as a wounded veteran, were first in line for lucrative government jobs. So he's awarded millions and millions of dollars in contracts. In contracts. Mm -hmm. So he lived the life of oh, a millionaire. He was a millionaire, absolutely. The money furnished a lavish lifestyle, but it couldn't buy happiness. In April of 2013, Michelle filed for divorce and secured a protective order against Braulio. Verbal abuse, emotional abuse, sure. Yes, of course, I saw that. You know, the yelling, screaming, cursing, um, directed at her, directed at me. According to Commonwealth attorneys Alex Ruida and Nicole Whitman, divorce papers allege disturbing behavior. He locked her in a closet one time for a couple of hours, demanding that he have sex with her. She was always scared of him, and she told her friends repeatedly, if something happens to me, is the one that killed me. The Castillos were married for nearly 18 years, but before the ink on his divorce papers was dry, Castillo had already moved on. He was dating a triathlete. He also moved right down the street from his estranged wife. For her part, Michelle maintained an unbreakable bond with her kids and sought to rebuild her battered self-esteem. She was the best kind of mom you could think of, right? Somebody who cared about her children, always before everything else, um, before herself, before anyone. She, you know, got herself stronger. She was becoming a triathlete. You know, she, her, she was becoming stronger in mind. She was becoming stronger in body. She was just a great person, a, a caring, loving, joyful person. So what caused Michelle to fall into such sudden despair that she would take her own life? 
March 19th, Michelle and Braulio met that afternoon to finalize terms of their divorce. I know that she was seeking somewhere in the neighborhood of fourteen dollars to $17,000 a month in child support. His uh, divorce attorney kept wanting to negotiate as part of the divorce settlement that she withdraw that protective order. She was adamant that that protective order stay in place and in fact when uh, he had visitation with the children. He was not allowed to pick them up or drop them off at her house. That's how I mean, dangerous. That's how dangerous she thought he was, and that's how scared she was of him. But the court's decision is delayed. Later that evening, Michelle picks up her children from a visit with Braulio. She was out with her friends celebrating the fact that she had just qualified for the Boston Marathon and had just days before completed running her first triathlon. Michelle put the kids down for the night, set the security alarm, and went to bed. According to lead investigator Mark McCaffrey, the children woke the next morning and called their father in a panic. They said, Mom isn't here, we don't know, and they were crying, they were upset, and they were scared. Because of his restraining order, Braulio asks a neighbor to search the house for Michelle while he takes his kids to school. So he left, and uh, the neighbor thought this was so odd that he called, the neighbor actually called the police. Word of Michelle's disappearance reaches oldest son, Nick, who's away at college. But I um, constantly kept calling because I was informed that somebody couldn't find my mom. Oh, I got a message and then I was, I asked if it was a joke because it wasn't, I said it because it's not funny. Um, and then I was told it wasn't a joke. Are you I worried call, at this point? Oh, I'm freaking out. Cops arrive to search the home and make a gruesome discovery. Michelle is hanging from a shower head in the basement bathroom, an electrical cord wrapped around her neck. It looked at first blush, yes, as a, like a suicide. There's a woman hanging from the uh, shower. The children told me that they had searched the basement, but later on it was pretty apparent that they did not search the entire basement, and I think that's merciful that that didn't happen. And I can't imagine what would have happened had one of them seen her. And, and I'm not sure, to be honest with you, that one of them didn't. They say they didn't, but they said they also looked for their mother. Detective McCaffrey has the solemn burden of calling Nick. And I knew what he was going to say before he said it. You did? Yeah, it's one of those things where it, it was just a gut feeling. So I knew what was happening. I just didn't want it to be true. He's, you know, a 19 or 20 year old boy away at college, supposed to be having the time of his life. And next thing he knows, he gets a phone call that his mother's dead. And they took him straight to see his siblings, and he was the one that had to give them the death notice. And I told them that, you know, that things are going to be okay. It's okay to be sad. It's going to be really hard to hear, but mom is dead, and she's, she's not going to come back, and I'm sorry. I'm, I'm really sorry, because I, I, we couldn't do anything. But something about this suburban tragedy doesn't sit well with investigators. Her, she was forward and her hair had been pulled in front of her face and the ligature was pulled around and on top of the hair and pulled. That's painful to begin with. People don't do that and I've had lots of suicides. I've, I've, I've never seen anything like that. It looked like it was staged. It looked like something you would expect to see at some haunted house or something. It looked very surreal. But who could have staged it? The house was locked all night, the alarm set, and Michelle made certain that her embattled ex did not have the code. It was odd. Up next, a grainy snippet of surveillance footage surfaces that could turn a suicide into a murder. We're back with more on the mysterious death of Michelle Castillo, who died inside her Virginia mansion while four of her kids slept upstairs. Here's Michelle Sagona. Chris, police may not have been able to solve this case if it had not been for a surveillance camera from a neighbor's house that caught a man entering the Castillo home on the night of the murder. Michelle Castillo, a 43-year-old mother of five found hanging in a basement shower, apparently having taken her own life. This was somebody who was happy, joyful, looking forward to her freedom. At first, it appeared Michelle had committed suicide, but the lead investigator in the case knew something was off and he was determined to prove that this was a murder. I was told that she said that, that, that she committed suicide, but it didn't look like suicide. So I said, well, that's right, because it isn't. So figure out what happened. I called up Mr. Castillo and I explained who I was 
And I said, I needed to speak to him right away. Michelle's estranged husband, Raleo, lives just a few blocks away, and Detective McCaffrey reaches his home in less than a minute. And I see him at the top of the stairs. He's on his phone. And then he comes down, and he tells me he's on the phone with his lawyer, and his lawyer advised him not to speak to me. On the phone with his lawyer? He doesn't even know why you're there. Yeah. And the other thing I noted about that was he had a black eye and a scratch running down his face. Did you ask him about that at the scene? Well, he lawyered up right away, so there's not much of me asking him anything. You couldn't ask him anything? I couldn't really ask him anything. Raleo is now a prime suspect, but cops first need to prove that Michelle's death was murder, not suicide. I went to the autopsy the next day, and there was extensive injuries. What types of injuries? Facial injuries, there was bruising to her face, her neck, obviously. But one of the most telling injuries I saw, her shins, both her legs, badly bruised. That was indicative of somebody thrashing around and kicking. You believe that she was in some sort of altercation prior to her death? It was looking that way. Prosecutor Nicole Whitman shares Detective McCaffrey's suspicion. As soon as I walked in, I could tell this wasn't the home of a mother who would have killed herself. I could see that her life was very similar to mine. She was a mother of children, and they were obviously the central focus of her life. So it struck me almost immediately that this doesn't seem like somebody who would voluntarily leave her children alone. This did not appear to be a woman who was going to take her life. Not even close. There was nothing in her life that indicated that. Soon, forensic evidence begins to support that conclusion. What was interesting to me is when we dusted the shower stall, there were no prints, nobody's prints. No one's prints. No one's prints, and it looked like there was white marks. There was nothing there, it was wiped down. Now, if somebody stepped into the shower, their fingerprints would be on there. There were no fingerprints on there. Analysis of Michelle's clothing also reveals startling clues. What did you find on Michelle's sweatshirt? Blood. There was a pattern, a type of pattern blood and spots on her, uh, on her shirt, on her sleeves. Interviews with Michelle's kids raise major questions too. One of the children had noted he had uh, his attention to detail was pretty, pretty amazing for uh, 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 someone that young. He had noted to us that the bed did not look right when he went in his mother's bedroom that morning looking for her. The bed was made but it was not made the way she did it. So when the CSI folks, when they stripped the bed, they found blood on a pillowcase. But it will take two weeks for DNA test to confirm whose blood. He wasn't in that house for a whole year, allegedly, so his blood shouldn't have been anywhere near there. In the meantime, police begin to look deeper into Braulio's past for any misdeeds. It doesn't take long. All right there. Remember his status as a wounded veteran, the one that got him those lucrative government contracts? Would you believe it was a football injury from prep school? He twisted his ankle in the 11th grade of a military prep school. He was never in the service. Then he went on to play four years of college ball and then went on with his life. This sleazy twisting of the rules didn't sit well with Congresswoman Tammy Duckworth, an actual wounded veteran who lost both legs and the use of one arm while flying a chopper in Iraq. In 2013, Duckworth grilled Castillo before Congress. Mr. Castillo, how are you? Thank you. Thank you for being here today. I, I'm not well, but you're welcome. All right. So your foot hurt? Your left foot? Uh, yes, ma'am. It hurts. Yeah, my feet hurt too. In fact, in your letter to a government official, I think it's the SVA, um, attention, Gina Mu, you said, my family and I have made considerable sacrifices for our country. My service-connected disability status should serve as a testimony to that end. I can't play with my kids because I can't walk without pain. These are crosses, these are crosses that I bear due to my service to our great country and I would do it again to protect this great country. I'm so glad that you would be willing to play football in prep school again to protect this great country. Shame on you, Mr. Castillo. Shame on you. You may not have broken any laws, but you certainly broke the trust of this great nation. Shady business dealings are one thing. Murder is something else entirely. Detective McCaffrey canvasses the neighborhood for surveillance footage from the night of the murder and scores a potential hit. This video from a camera across the street. It shows Michelle arriving home at 819. Unfortunately, there is no sign of an intruder or possible suspect. I was looking at the time frame from midnight on and I didn't see any perpetrator going into the house and I 
couldn't understand it because if it was after midnight, the alarm would have went off. Those kids would have woken up. Everybody would have woken up. So I couldn't understand it. And I'd lay there at night thinking, you know, in the initial stages, how did this happen? How many hours did you pour over that footage, studying it, frame countless, by frame? Countless hours, countless hours. But thanks to some pillow talk, the detective catches a break. At one point, I was laying there at night, I was just going to sleep, and <laughs> my wife watches these crime shows, and she said, well, maybe he got in before 12 o'clock, maybe he got in before Michelle got home. I was like, I was kind of like, I think I dismissed it. She claims I, I rolled my eyes and she got a little upset with me, but I didn't. I thought it through. And then the next day I called up the CSI people and said, can we get video from 8 o'clock at night? Because that's the last known time Brawley was seen. And at 8.09, I see a figure that looks suspiciously like him. I couldn't identify him 100% running down the street at 8.09 and enter that house. Then at 8.19, I see the mother and the children go into the house. And then at 12.31, I see a figure uh, run out of the house and we reviewed it. McCaffrey thinks he's got his man, but he's about to be dealt a shocking blow that could destroy the entire case. Coming up, DNA results reveal all new details and the bombshell testimony from a heartbreaking witness will blow this case wide open. It was no secret that multimillionaire Braulio Castillo and his estranged wife Michelle were not in love anymore. In fact, the two were in the middle of a very contentious divorce. But was that animosity so deep that it was enough to kill for? Here's Michelle Sagona with the conclusion of today's murder mystery. The noose was tightening around Braulio Castillo. All signs were pointing to him as a suspect in his wife's murder. That was first thought to be a mysterious suicide. And police just scored video proof that an intruder entered the home before Michelle and her kids came home and ran away some four hours later. Is Braulio the man on the video? Investigators can't be sure yet. They need more. The detectives ran cadaver dogs through that house. And cadaver dogs basically alert to the scent of human decomposition. This was 17 days after the murder. Michelle's body was gone by then, long gone. The house had been cleaned by um, Mr. Castillo's family. The sheets had been changed, the bedding was gone. And the dog immediately ran down to the basement and alerted in the shower where Michelle was hanging. They pulled the dog off that. The dog then went through the entire house, over 10,000 square feet. The dog alerted in one other place in the house, and that was at the foot of Michelle's bed. This is not the uh, walking dead. Uh, nobody's walking from two crime scenes. So you definitely believe that she was likely dead upstairs in her bedroom? There's no doubt in my mind. DNA tests finally come back, erasing any doubts for investigators. It's their man, Braulio Castillo. And we had gotten the defendant's blood on Michelle Castillo's sweatshirt in multiple locations, as well as on one of the sheets in her bed. The blood evidence, that's like, it was, once I came back from the lab, and I read that, it was Miller time. It was like, oh, thankfully. I remember yelling and screaming and jumping, and my kids are looking at me, asking me what's going on, and I said, you know what, we just won. McCaffrey finds Castillo relaxing in a local coffee shop. We went up, approached him, and uh, he said, oh, hi, Mark, kind of surprised. I said, hi, can you stand up? And we stood up, I said, you're under arrest. It was a nice moment. <laughs> But on the eve of the trial, McCaffrey is hit with news that could jeopardize the entire case. He's fired by the county sheriff. He claims it's because he voted for his boss's opponent in the recent election. You lost your job. Yes, yes. As the lead detective in as this the, case. Yeah, yeah. At Christmas time, I was taking my kids on a family vacation to Williamsburg for Christmas Light Festival, and uh, I got the call that I wasn't coming back. I was concerned that these defense attorneys would somehow convince this jury that there was a problem with the lead detective. That's why he wasn't resworn. And so, you know, if you can't trust the lead detective, how can you Who trust can the you evidence? Trust? Yeah. Right. And you lose your job, but you still show up in that courtroom every day. And you mm -hmm. still give this case 110%. Oh, absolutely. How could you not? Adding to the drama, another key witness has an even more difficult time showing up in court. 
How hard was it for you to make that decision to testify against your father? It was very hard from the, from the standpoint of that this is my dad. I don't want this to be my dad. It looks like my dad. This could be my dad. I think it's my dad. It is my dad. I had to go through that process, right, to slowly but surely make my way to the end where I said it was. And you knew it was him entering and then leaving? Yes. On both times? On both times, yeah. Without a doubt in your mind? You think he was inside that house? I know he was inside that house. Those children, she bathed them, she fed them, she put them to bed, read them a story, they said prayers and said good night. That was about between 9, 9.30. All the time, Mr. Castillo was in that house, probably in the basement waiting, and then he ambushed her later on. This was a very quick but very savage attack. We feel that he disabled her very quickly um, and got her unconscious very quickly. Jurors also hear the heart-wrenching closed-circuit testimony from Castillo's nine-year-old son, who testified he had left his security blanket in his mother's room on the night of her death. And Mr. Castillo, I think, realized that this kid's gonna come popping out and come back into this room looking for this security blanket. And so what the little boy said was that his father appeared and brought him his little lovey blanket. He said he didn't say anything to him, but he gave him the blanket. And I asked him, how did you know it was your dad? And he said, because I saw his face. The last moments with his mom. It was awful for everyone. That nine-year-old's testimony had a profound effect on Sherry Mullenberg, one of the jurors. It was the fact that he said his dad brought him his blanket. That was really important for all of us. I know he was telling the truth when he said that. It was very difficult for the jury to hear that testimony, but they wanted to testify. They wanted to be there for their mother. Raleo's nine-year-old son offers one last damning piece of information, how his dad got in the house that night. He said, I know you did it, dad, and I know you did this, and you made me give you the passcode, and you, and, and you yelled at me. It was, it was just a, a horrific time. Horrific moment. By the end of the first day of deliberations, the jury reaches its verdict. Guilty of first degree murder. What was the reaction from people? Her, uh, sorry. <laughs> um, her friends and family were um, really grateful, really thankful. And you know, obviously Braulio and, and his family were really upset. Castillo is sentenced to life without parole, plus 16 years. What a selfish, horrific, pernicious, insidious, horrifying thing to have done to these children. Leaving behind a family torn apart by the murder of its loving mother trying to heal. Today, the four youngest remain together in a new home. These children are actually thriving, if you can imagine it. But the eldest son, Nick, still struggles to make sense out of such a senseless loss. It's really, really hard on the mind. It hurts me every day, every time I think about it. I think about it right now, it gets me all choked up. Braulio Castillo maintains that his wife committed suicide and that he's innocent. At his sentencing, he did not address the court or show any emotion when his children vilified him. Nick Castillo is currently suing his father for wrongful death, hoping to get back some of the family inheritance that he says his dad cleaned out before he went to prison. Coming up, a single mother and her son ambushed in their home in the middle of the night. I can just hear the noise. Bloom, 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 bloom. Somebody was trying to kill me. And when cops try to track down the killer, they get a confession in the most shocking way imaginable. And this is something that I could not help. Next. We're back now with a fugitive so brazen that while he was on the run from police, he would hop onto Facebook and start broadcasting live. The gun went off in my chest. I go, boom. She was shot five times at point blank range. And I started running down the hallway. And that's when a gun is just spraying boom, 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 boom at me. But there is only one reason Keisha Valentine is alive. I said, oh my God, I'm gonna die on this floor. 
That one reason? A guardian angel. Her 15-year-old son who took the rest of the bullets for his mom. Yeah, my mom and the monster behind this terrifying midnight massacre? Multiple gunshot holes in the walls and the floor. There was a lot of blood. He's now on the road hunting for his next target, live on Facebook. And this is something I could not help. Keisha Valentine is a hardworking single mom with two bright teenage kids, 19-year-old Debonay and 15-year-old Earl III. They were the best of friends. They really were. The family goes through some tough times when Keisha's marriage breaks up. She left her husband and home in Richmond, Virginia, and moved to Norlina, North Carolina, closer to her family. He would cheat. I wouldn't say dating, and I knew about it. He was out there having he other relationships. Cheating. He was a cheater. But things are improving. I was finally starting to live. I had a new job. I was working, taking care of those children. Debonay is away from home for the first time, a college freshman. And that leaves Earl, the young man of the house, alone with his mom. He loves his mother, and <laughs> everyone knows that Earl would do anything for me. But it's not easy for Earl to watch his older sister and best friend leave home. He even made a special video for the occasion. Shh. Hopefully you keep this in the memory. When you go to college, you might you'll watch this and remember about your brother when you go to college. He made a video for you? He wouldn't even come to my graduation. That's how sad he was I was leaving. On the night before her life changes forever, Keisha makes sure her son is home safe and locks up the house before bedtime. Then she sets her own homemade alarm in case anyone should try to break into the house. I set it up so that I would know if anything were to come through and this would fall first and you would hear that big thud. So I would hear all that should someone come through this door. No one has ever made an attempt to force the door. But for the first time ever in the small dark hours of the morning, Keisha hears the sound of that board crashing to the floor. <laughs> loud and clear. I was in there um, sleeping in my room and I just heard like a bang type noise. It's like something crashed over. I just sat up in the bed like, did I really just hear that? And I actually went out of my room, looked, couldn't see anything, it was pitch black. Next, Keisha's home is transformed into a living hell with bullets flying in the dark. I can just hear the noise, bloom, 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 bloom. Somebody was trying to kill me. Keisha Valentine and her son have been ambushed in their home and shot at point blank range. And as police search for the gunman, that suspect would soon make himself known, even confess to his crime on, of all places, Facebook. Long past midnight, Keisha Valentine and her 15-year-old son Earl are asleep in their bedrooms and the house is locked up tight and quiet. When a crashing sound jolts her awake and out of bed. It sounded like the door caved in, but I was not quite 100% sure. And that's when I started my walk up that hallway to see what happened. She can barely see in the dark, then the flash of a gunshot. The gun went off in my chest, like a boom. Keisha turns and stumbles, scrambling back into her bedroom for shelter as the gunman chases her, still firing. You don't even know how many times you're shot at that point. I felt weak. My body was getting weak, and so I'm grabbing on to the side of my door, and I make it in there, push that door behind me. My legs give out. I fell straight dead on the floor. And I said, I'm going down this floor. And that's when the madman turns on Earl, who jumped out of bed to save his mom and runs straight into flying bullets. I don't know if when he heard me running and heard the gun going off. Keisha struggles to remain conscious. The shooter seems to have left the house. But for as long as she lives, she will never forget the words she hears next. It's Earl. He's hurt too, but he's on his cell phone calling for help. That 911 call. That's all I heard of him. I'm a mom with the emergency. You're my mom if you think shot. Excuse me? You're my mom if you think shot. You and your mother have been shot. The police station is only minutes away. Officer Anton Edwards gets the call and races to the scene. And this veteran cop is stunned at the carnage he finds inside the house. The door was open and I walked up and I said, is everything okay? And there's a voice inside that says, help me, I've been shot. Did you see Earl the third? Yes, I did. And was he conscious, alert, and breathing? Uh, he was not very alert. I asked him what happened, he told me he'd been shot. It's so bad, Police Chief Taylor Bartholomew is also called in for this one. Describe to me the crime scene inside the house. Multiple gunshot holes in the walls, in the floor. 
there was a lot of blood, and I, you know, I was amazed that uh, Keisha survived, honestly, if you saw the crime scene and how bad it was. Both Keisha and Earl are rushed to a nearby hospital. Both are in critical condition. What was getting you through those moments? I was worrying about Earl the whole time. I kept asking, where is Earl? Where is Earl? They tell me my son's going in, I guess, another ambulance or something. Keisha drifts in and out of consciousness in the ICU. But when she can speak, she only wants to know one thing. I would kept trying to say Earl, and they say, you can't talk right now. And every time I would get ready to say something, it's like as if they push medicine in me and just, and I fall right back to sleep every time I try to talk. They, as they tell me, no, I'll make it the first 24 hours. Cops are desperate to find out who would unleash this vicious attack on a defenseless mother and her young son. But it isn't long before they get a confession in the most shocking way imaginable. And it's no random stranger. He's Earl Valentine Sr., Keisha's ex-husband and the father of Earl III. What's up, everybody? Immediately after the shooting, he's letting the world know on Facebook live that he's the man who did it. I just killed my wife. She lied on me, had warrants taken out on me. She drugged me all the way down to nothing. According to Keisha, he's made several threats before, but this is the first time he's dared to follow through. Earl got out of control over um, money and made a whole lot of threats on wanting to kill me. He would say such things, but the, the mannerism of how he would say them was in such a way as being sarcastic, not in a serious, oh, I'm going to come kill you like, they, like you hear on television. I loved my wife, but she deserved what she had coming. I've been very sick for months. And this is something that I could not help. Did he have a past criminal history? He had a criminal history with, when they not, within our marriage, yes. What was he arrested for? Drug charges. When he did not have it, you saw an uh, animal, like a wolf, just coming after you type um, personality. And Keisha's daughter, Debonay, recalls one horrifying moment years before, when her father actually pulled a gun on her. So your father put a gun to your head mm -hmm. and wanted money from you. Yeah, pretty much. And you had an order of protection in place against your own father mm -hmm. because he was that dangerous of a man. Yeah, he was. And now Chief Bartholomew manages to get on the phone with Earl as he's on the run. He gets a blood chilling response. What was his state of mind during those conversations? He was concerned about whether or not uh, he had actually killed Keisha Valentine. He wanted to know, was she dead? I relayed to him the harm that he had caused to his son, and I could tell at that point he was kind of in shock about that. The chief quickly realizes this unfolding tragedy is far from over. At that point, he had indicated to me that, uh, that he, had, he had planned to cause harm to the rest of her family. So, I mean, our concern was making contact with them and making sure they were safe. So I don't know if I'm going to make it where I'm going, but if I don't, I wish all of you a good life. And I knew at that moment that it would be one of two ways, that he wasn't coming in alive. And my main fear that he would, he would harm another, uh, another officer. Even at Debonay's college campus, more than 60 miles away, security is on the lookout. You thought your father was coming to kill you? Yeah, like in my school, they had a flyer, and they sent it to the whole school, like with his face on it. Your father's face went out to your entire college. And then, three days after this bloody rampage, Earl Valentine is finally cornered by police at a motel in Columbia, South Carolina. John, tell us how this all unfolded. On the run after he, police say he murdered his 15-year-old son and shot his estranged wife in the chest. We were able, you know, to, to get a location on him and to, to get uh, local, state, and federal law enforcement uh, to, to his location, get him surrounded. Cops fear a ferocious gun battle. But Earl fires only one shot, and it's over. We were getting ready to enter the building. Um, like the coward he was, he took his own life instead of facing us. Back at the hospital, Keisha is still fighting for her life. To the doctor's amazement, she is slowly winning the battle. And she still desperately wants to know only one thing. I screamed it. Where is Earl? First thing coming out of my mouth. And then her world comes crashing down around her all over again. A gentleman in a white coat comes up to me. Keisha Valentine, like, yes. So where is my son? Where is Earl? I hate to inform you that in that shooting you were in, your son passed. 
and the man walks out of the room. Her son, Earl Valentine III, is dead at just 15. It seemed like a dream, to be honest. I still can't believe it to this day someone tell me like that. Gunned down at the hands of his own father, but not before he literally saves his mother's life with his own quick thinking, bleeding to death as he calls for help. You know how I'm sitting here. I know. You have a lot of faith. And I've got to be strong for him, because he made the call to get me where I am today. He's a hero. He is a hero. Are you disappointed Earl took his life and is not here to face justice? Of course I am. I'm angry by it because I wanted to ask him, what made you go off the deep end? How do you feel now that you've killed your son? And the tragedy is doubled as Keisha takes another listen to the last words of her son's 911 call. In fact, his very last words in this world. Earl III knows who shot him. You and your mother been shot. Yeah, my dad. What's your name? Hello? 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 You believe he saw your husband's face, his own father's face. I know he saw his father because he wouldn't have known. I know he did. Today, Dibene still treasures the video her little brother made for her only weeks before he died. Hopefully you keep this in the memory. For when you go to college, you might you'll watch this and remember about your brother when you go to college. Um, he was like, um, don't forget about him when I go to college. For Keisha, the healing comes slowly as well. She's still partially paralyzed, wondering if she'll ever walk again. You still have bullets lodged inside of you. Yeah, I still have one in my spine. So you just had a bullet removed just this week? Yes. Do doctors say, Keisha, you're going to walk again, or we don't know? Of course they don't know. They don't believe I'm alive, lady. They can't believe I exist. That's the ultimate goal. I want to walk again. When my walking proves I'm back 100% being Keisha. I want to be like I was. And the love and the pride she carries for her son Earl will always count more than the five bullets she took in that hallway. His spirit is amongst us every day every day and I'm stronger because of it keeps me strength trust me you ask me every day how, how do I do it I do it because of Earl